that they were neither men nor monkeys, yet looked like both. They were entirely sexless. They had no sex appeal at all. Nope. I was not attracted to them. That's a, a, a not a 10. Yeah. It's about a three and a half on a good day. They were entirely sexless. Their bodies covered with long, coarse hair, except where scabs and running sores had replaced it. Each one seemed to be reaching out for me and striving to be the first to get me. The air was full of their cries and the stench from their sores and bodies made me faint. Oh, so you made it easy for them, didn't you? Just <laughs> plopping right over like, oh, damn, this is super easy hunting. Thanks, Charlie. I forgot my broken gun and tried to use it on the first ones. And then I threw it at them and turned and ran. God, how I did run. I could feel their hot breath on my back. Their long, claw-like fingers scraped my back. The smell from their steaming, stinking bodies was making me sick. While the noises they made, yelling, screaming, and breathing, drove me mad. Breathing left. How I reached the canoe or how I hung onto that piece of quartz is a mystery to me. When I came to, it was night, and I was laying in the bottom of my canoe, drifting between Thomas Bay and Sukhoi Island, cold, hungry, and crazy for a drink of water. If only I had been floating on a lake. No, just kidding. <laughs> Actually, I think that's ocean right there. Oh, well, drink it. A little salty, but it's all good. Yeah. When the story was told, Charlie passed out of the men's lives. They chalked it up to fantasy caused by loneliness and morbid thought. While some might say this sounds like Bigfoot, we have found that the Kushtaka tales have possibly morphed into legend of Bigfoot through the years while the land otter man has been part of, uh, of aboriginal myth long before we started calling anything Sasquatch or Bigfoot. What do you think of that story? It was pretty interesting. I think I might have heard that one before. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's the greatest story ever told. So of course I did, yeah. yeah. That is an interesting, The there's a lot of detail in there, the scabby, oozy, Ugh. No, thanks. If something like that even touched me, I'd be like, oh, God, where's some sanitizer? You know what I mean? Yeah, but it would uh, be too late by then. Yeah, Charlie probably wasn't too worried about sanitizer. No. He's been out in the bush for a few days. Yeah. He probably smelled wonderful. Yeah. But did he did he consider, if he peed on himself, maybe that's how he got away. Um, I don't think he knew that because the, the ways of protecting yourselves comes from, from the native. Mm. You know, the n native Alaskans. Yeah, and Charlie uh, doesn't sound like a native Alaskan. No. Mm. So, but maybe... He, in fear, peed on himself, and then Kushtak was like, oh, no, now I can't see him. He might have done more than pee on himself. Yeah, might have fertilized the earth a little bit while he was running. <laughs> Christian, can you tell us a little bit about a Clinkett folktale called The Land Otter's Captive? Yes, I can. It just hit me. It just came to my mind. I'd like to hear about this. It's a great story. It was recorded by John Swanton of the Bureau of American Ethnology. Several persons once went out from Sitka together when their canoe upset and all were drowned except a man of the kicks adi a canoe came to this man and he thought it he thought that it contained his friends but they were really land otters they started southward with him and kept going further and further until they passed clear around queen charlotte islands at every place where they stopped they took a, in a female land otter nice yep turn this into a party real quick yeah we gotta see human let's go party yeah you ever been a part of a land otter orgy i don't think it sounds great man you're gonna have to bleep that word out. Man. <laughs> We're a family show. <laughs> All this time, they kept a mat made out of the broad part of a piece of kelp over the man they had captured until the length. At length, they arrived at the place they called Rainy Village, which I believe is pronounced Siwuani, but I could be wrong. Siwuani. That's much. It's you're, the way you say it sounds much better. I could still be wrong though. I know. As long as it sounds better, being wrong. You know what I mean? Yep. That's half the battle. At this place, the man met an aunt who had been drowned years before and had become the wife of two land otters. She was dressed in a groundhog robe. Then she said to him, your aunt's husband will save you. You must come to see me this evening. When he came, his aunt said, I can't leave these people for I have learned to think a great deal of them. Afterwards, his aunt's husband started back with him and his aunt's husband, remember, is a kushtaka. What's well, a plus. Yeah. They did not camp until midnight. Their canoe was a skate. And as soon as... They came ashore. They were turn it over on top of him so that no matter how hard he tried to get out, he could not. In Amani? making a passage across to Cape Amani, Amane, something like that, they worked very hard. And shortly after they landed, they heard the raven. 
They could only go a short distance for food. When they first started back, the woman had said to her husbands, don't leave him where he can be captured again. Take him to a good place. So they left him close to Sitka. Then he walked around in the neighborhood of the town and made the people suffer so much every night that they could not sleep and determined to capture him. They fixed a rope in such a way as to ensnare him, but at first they were unsuccessful. Finally, however, they placed dog bones in the rope so that it would stick to his hands. Late that night, the land otter man tore his hands with these bones. Then he sat down and began to scream. And while he was doing this, they got the rope around him and captured him. When they got him home, he was at first very wild, but they restored his reason by cutting his head with dog bones. He was probably not so far gone as most victims. Then they learned what had happened to him. After this time, however, he would always eat his meat and fish raw. Once when he was among the halibut fishers, they they wanted very much to have him eat some cooked halibut. He was a good halibut fisher, probably having learned the art form from the land otters, though he did not say so. For a long time, the man refused to take any, but at last consented and the food killed him. So the cooked halibut killed this man? Yep. Even though that's the ideal way to eat halibut? Not, not for land otters. Hmm. I can't imagine that would happen. That's where you lose me, Christian, on the cooked fish bit. It was a good run, honestly. It was a good yeah, run. Yeah, I mean, but... you're coming over to the to the skeptic side, I guess, huh? Yeah, it's all about that cooked halibut. It's delicious. Why did he die? So it sounds like skinwalkers to you, but are there other things? Not really. No, to be honest. I mean, I've I've read a, a decent amount about Kushtaka and stuff over the past few years since I heard about it. And it, it, to me, it could stand up as its own cryptid. I don't think it needs to be like lumped in with anything else, you know? No, it doesn't feel like it, especially because it's an old, it's not, it's, it's not one that was morphed from yeah. other tales. Yeah, there's a great deal of cryptids out there. And they all slightly vary from each other in one way or another. So this could just be another offset of that, you know? Yeah. So in 1925, Scott, a man lost his dogs in the hills of Thomas Bay. I don't know why he's in Thomas Bay, because it's the Bay of Death. Maybe he didn't like his dogs. I don't, I don't understand that way of thinking, but there are people that don't like dogs in this world. Was there more to that story? Yes. He hmm. found tracks that he said resembled that of a cross between bear and human footprints. When he returned to his traps, he found that some had been sprung while others were damaged. He later went out to look for his dog again because obviously he loved his dog Mm. and was gone forever. Or was never seen again. Yeah. Yeah. True Alaska stories, which happens a lot. It's a big place for sure, and it's a dangerous place in general. But I don't know if that would explain the bare human hybrid footprint looking things you know that that could only be one of several things that we're aware of yeah it could also be a kushtaka maybe he was it's a shape shifter so maybe it went from bear to human and midway through that shape shifting it just planted its feet down some mud i mean it happens in movies all the time we're talking about reality here christian maybe you can get on board all right um movies are reality in our world you can go to the theater and see them before we move on i should tell you a a story about when I was writing this. Please do. And I'm sure you've noticed it when you start looking into a subject, maybe writing about it for the podcast, you get a little spook. It depends on the hour of day I'm doing it. But yeah. yeah. This time th- I was at home, Mandy was at work and I, I walk into the office, the windows open, you know, you can kind of hear kids outside and the cars and stuff. And then I heard my, my name being called and I'm like, what the hell? So I get really close to the window and kind of pretty much stick my ear to it. Yeah. And I hear my name called again. At first I was like, oh, that sounds like my name, but it's not. Yeah. And then I was like, that's my name, but who out here knows my name? And then I heard it a couple more times and I was like, really like freaking out. Yeah. I was like, am I being called? Is this how it, how it starts? Will I ever finish this episode? Probably not. And it was Mandy calling from the living room through my can through the cameras. Cause she texted me and I didn't respond. Wow. But I was freaking out, <laughs> you know, and I'm like skeptical, but yeah. when something like that happens and, but if it's in your face, you're going to acknowledge it. Yeah. Your name is being called completely out of context. Yeah. You didn't even, I, I didn't even think about the cameras cause it, it didn't sound like it was coming from the living room. It sounded like it was coming from outside. I was, yeah. The speakers on those things aren't necessarily the best either. So it would sound like it's being thrown a little more. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And then there was another spooky thing that happened. What's that? I went outside at night, which I do to go out and get air, you know? That is spooky. Yeah. And you have one of those motion detecting lights mm-hmm. that I leave on back there. Yeah. So I walk out there and the light's on. Look in. And when I'm wearing my glasses, sometimes the line, the lights reflect off the back of my glasses. Yeah. And it's really hard to see. So I'm like, okay, what's going on here? 
And I'm standing there looking at the trees and in the bushes and stuff. And out walks a little black and white cat from underneath the car. Yeah. After its shape changed from a kushtaka to Clearly. a cat. Yeah. I was like, when is this going to get...